Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, a very biased collection as usual. Um, today, maybe kind of a theorem, uh, there will be a theorem, but it's more like a type of knot, a very, very specific type of knot. We will come back to that on the last slide, um, but also a very, very nice type of knot, which are called the torus knots. So kind of knot theory is this um, idea of, uh, well, having shoelaces and you want to study shoelaces or having DNA knots and you want to study DNA knots. Turns out that knot theory is kind of a complicated field in the sense that, not in the sense of explaining it, it's actually very, very beautiful, but more like there are no really many um, theorems about all knots. And part of the problem is that knots sit at the heart of like everything in low dimensional topology, certainly at three and four dimensional topology. So what people always try to do um, is to find nice subclasses of knots where you can say more. And torus knots are really, really nice subclasses of knots. And essentially they're determined by two numbers which are usually called P and Q, and they're about windings. Uh, we'll see what that means. But let's get started again. So knots in three space is really a beautiful idea. Just take a string, take S1. So a string in, in mathematics always means to have N exclude, like in this picture here, for example. And you study uh, kind of this object in three space up to deforming, like always in topology turns out to be one of the most applicable fields of mathematics. So here on the, on the left-hand side, we clearly have some kind of picture from mathematics. So there's a knot in the middle and you see its shadows, its projections um, to the plane. And well, here there's also a knot in the middle, but it's actually a protein knot. So this picture is stolen from a paper in biology. Um, so proteins tend to not and uh, it's not so much about the ingredients or the chemical ingredients of the, of the protein, but much more about how it's knotted that determines its properties. And proteins are at the heart of life, I guess. So if you want, life is very knotted, which I certainly would sign with blood. Anyway, um, at kind of the same point, it's the same kind of point, though, the biologists also sh study those shadows of knots. Um, and yeah, it's very, actually very nice. So not theory, a very, very nice field of mathematics studying of, well, those objects in three space. Uh, turns out that these are usually quite complicated to, stu to study. As I said, there are not many general theorems. So it's more like about finding invariants. But you can always ask the question is, maybe there's a nice subclass, as I said, and maybe a nice subclass is given by embedding knots into other spaces than our good old R3, which is here sitting in the background. It's also sitting in the background here, right? It's really uh, something in three space. You can move your knot in three space. Maybe we can do on a different type of, in a different type of object. Uh, maybe it's in a smaller object, maybe it gets easier. And this is where the notion of a torus knot comes from. Uh, there's a torus somewhere, so there should be a torus somewhere. And that's exactly what happens. So not on a torus is a torus knot. That's just it. What's a torus? A torus is the usual donut type shape. It's not a donut, it's hollow. So it's a swim ring, whatever you want to call it, um, but that's a torus. So we, we think of it as being really as a standard one. So as you can see here in my little very pathetic drawing or on the left-hand side in the picture. So the standard torus, which itself, of course, sits in R3. And a torus knot is now a very specific type of knot that actually already lives on the surface of the torus. Right? It's obviously still in R3 because the torus is in R3, but it's more restrictive. It sits on the surface of uh, the torus. And on the surface of the torus means without the dissections, like the picture you see here. So this is not intersecting here, for example, one of them goes in the back and one of them goes in the front of the torus, so they're not really intersecting. And that's a special kind of knot, and it's called a torus knot. Um, so and the question you can ask is, are all knots torus knots? Maybe we can always put knots on, to, on the surface of the torus, or in what sense are they special or whatever. But um, from the outset, it looks like there should be a very, very special set of knots because we are saying that there's a torus somewhere and the knot really lives on the surface of the torus. So you don't need the whole uh, kind of infinity and vast 
thickness of three space to realize your knot, but you only need the small donut type shape, the torus. So it, it kind of feels like this should be a very, 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 very special type of knot. And turns out that torus knots have a really, really simple classification. You could classify torus knots. There's no hope to classify knots, but we can classify torus knots. And it's pretty simple. They're classified by our little two numbers, P and Q. And it's really how often you run around uh, the meridian and the longitude of a torus. So let me try to draw a torus again. So here's a little torus. And since it's standard, we can talk about, so it's standard, it, it doesn't look very silly. It's really standard in R3. We could talk about the meridian, which goes around a kind of the, so you would cut it like this if you would cut a donut maybe. Uh, I got that uh, as a nice um, kind of way to think about it. It's not quite true, I wouldn't cut a donut like that. But the longitude goes around like you would cut a bagel, I guess. So that's, that's certainly true. So the longitude goes around like this. So you have those two curves on the torus, meridian and longitude, and P and Q just measure how often a knot winds around the meridian and how often it winds around the longitude. So let's do this example here, uh, the two, three. So we start somewhere, we walk around. So here it goes like this, and then it goes like this and comes back. And if you follow it, you realize it has done two turns around the meridian. The meridian, remember, is going like this. And we have done two turns. So here is the first and here is the second. Uh, so maybe I do the first one in. So it goes over, comes up under again, and goes over again. So that was the first turn. And the second turn is then the other one. It goes under and over again and comes back. Um, and it has three turns around the longitude, that's the second number, which means it runs around three times like this. And that's maybe a bit easier to see in this picture. So it goes uh, one, two, three times around, and that determines the torus knot. Similarly, this just goes in the opposite direction. Um, if you like to think of them as living uh, on the usual presentation of a, to of a torus using a square, then two, three does two turns here. So one, two, and three turns in this direction. And similarly, three, two, there's three turns here and two turns in this direction. And whatever, five, seven would do five turns here, uh, five and seven in this direction. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And as long as the greatest common divisor of those two numbers is one, this is needed for the curve to close up, if you think about it. Otherwise, it won't close up. Uh, so if the greatest common divisor is one, you get a torus knot with the PQ. And it's really just tracking the path, like going around P times the meridian, going around two Q times uh, the longitude in the standard uh, polygon decomposition or in the standard uh, embedding of the torus. And really just the, the PQ I said again is to make sure that the picture really closes into a closed picture. So you get a closed knot. So this is a huge family of torus knots. They kind of by design are torus knots because we define them by going around the meridian and the longitude a certain number of times. Um, but the point is, and that's maybe the theorem, so all knots of, all torus knots are of the form uh, T cube. And if you list them, they always look like they have a little torus in the middle. So here's a huge list of them. Um, and they always go around like crazy in one direction and the meridian direction and the longitude direction. So you can actually notice them to realize them pretty easily if they have a very nice shadow already. Um, and there's some redundancy, but essentially there's no redundancy here in this description. So for any P and Q, we get, let's say, a unique torus knot. That's not quite true. Uh, as I said, there are a few redundancies, something like this, but essentially for every P and Q, uh, we get a unique torus knot. And they're really, really cute. And they are much, much simpler than the general class of knots. I mean, you could already see it in this really beautiful picture that I stole, of course, the link is in the description, um, because it's really just this, this torus type shape. They ran around the torus. Not all knots ran around the torus. And actually we can, this theorem tells us that we can precisely nail down the knots that ran around the torus. They are always of the form meridian longitude operation or winding around which is a pretty cool theorem, actually. And it's not so clear from the outset that, first of all, there are torus knots. So this says there are infinitely many torus knots, but it's also saying we can nail them down. And that's actually a pretty cool uh, and nice theorem. 
so how many torch modes are there then? Well, essentially none. So I stole this from the usual online integer sequences. So the number of torus nodes, it's, it, well, it's just you count P and Q, and P and Q uh, just give you the number of crossings. So this is listed by number of crossings. You get a crossing number from it, and you can just list them, how many you have, up to those little redundancies. And it essentially, there are very, very few of them. So it starts off with 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. And the number of knots itself, uh, or the prime knots, well, which is a certain type of knot, prime knots, there are more knots than prime knots. And even the number of prime knots is ridiculously much bigger than the number of torus knots. So there are essentially no torus knots, right? So essentially none. So if you compare those numbers here, so zero, zero, that's fine. And then uh, one, zero, one, zero, and whatever. And here you get whatever, may very bigger numbers, so 9,988. 9, um, and on the other side, you get something like one or zero. <laughs> so really, really small. Anyway, so almost no knots are torus knots, actually, which follows directly. I um, mean, not directly. You still need to construct more knots, but it essentially follows from this main theorem. Okay, torus knots, a very special class of knots, a very nice class of knots. Essentially, no knot is a torus knot. And they're all classified by, so it's pretty beautiful, actually, winding around uh, the meridian of the torus and the longitude of the torus. You just have two numbers, uh, how often you wind around the meridian, how often you wind around the longitude, and that determines those torus knots. And the main theorem was a classification of torus knots. And I say it again, it's pretty impressive because classification of knots is just hopeless. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I will talk to see you next time.